Islam, Islam, peace and love, peace, love, and energy, energy, energy. I am Shade Renee L, All Rights Reserved, and I'm back at it again with another video. And today I'm actually going to be doing a compilation of videos that I have come across in regards to my research and the fraud of CPS, CFS, DFS acting as its agents and its members, the fraud that they continue to do in regards to our human rights, um, stealing babies and children away from families, um, disrupting families, breaking families apart, um, tormenting children, things of that nature. And I just want to share with you guys um, some of the videos that I came across. With that being said, thank you for your time. Please like, share, subscribe, donate. And I'm just going to play it straight through. Last year, but we can give you an in-depth look at one case that exemplifies the things we're hearing. Hundreds of complaints, allegations of quick trigger child removal with no proof of parental wrongdoing and then retaliation against those who fight back. You are looking at something hundreds of Kentuckians experience every year, but few others ever see. It's videotapes of a confidential hearing to remove children from the custody of their parents. While it may take weeks, months, or years to take someone's freedom away in a circuit court fine, it takes 17 minutes to take three of Vanessa Shank's children away in a family courtroom. This hearing consists of a judge, a state-appointed attorney to represent the children, a cabinet for health and family services attorney, and to his left, the only witness he will call, state social worker Carlanda Fields, who testifies Shanks gets no child support from an absent father who is thousands of dollars behind, and this is why she says Shanks' children have been taken away. The, the children are in our custody because of two substantiated reports of neglect. The first one was educational neglect on the children. The second one was um, medical neglect. And may I add, that's invasion of her privacy. Who is she to tell her um, and go and investigate how much her child's father owes or how much she makes? That's an invasion of my privacy. That has nothing to do with you. Was the um, original allegation, but um, they then came to the home and uh, said that um, the home was unsafe because I just got done doing laundry and there was a bleach bottle on the floor. The only proof offered of educational neglect is testimony from the social worker. What is that violation of fifth uh, or fourth, uh, where a person has the right to be secure in their persons and property? That one of the three children they removed had a kindergarten reading level, even though he was 11. As for the number of school days missed, no school records are offered, just an opinion from the caseworker. Was because she just was unable to get up and get them to school. On the allegation of medical neglect, no evidence of that is offered for two of the three children. The social worker testifies the other child, who has spina bifida, has missed some doctor's appointments. The children have been neglected in the sense that uh, she hasn't done what a, a reasonable parent would do to ensure that their parents or their children have... Uh, uh, safe and nurturing home and uh, uh, fulfilling their uh, their potential. Would that be correct? That is true. The mother is unable to maintain, establish or maintain employment, establish, maintain housing. 17 minutes into the hearing, the judge says he's heard enough. I think all the essential requirements have been established. I find that the requirements of the statute have been satisfied. That order of determination should issue for each of the three children. Not seeing them. I didn't see him for 11 months, and it was, it's devastating. It's like the hardest thing on earth. I can honestly relate to this mother, honestly. I haven't seen my baby in over six months, physically touched her. I haven't seen her as well in over two months, like over via Zoom. And this has been the most upsetting, most, like, I'm speechless. Like, this, the pain is like undescribable pain. It's undescribable pain being without without my baby. I totally understand and feel exactly word for word what she's saying. Go through. It's like someone close to you just dies. So when she fought back, died, appealing died. the ruling, she says they took her other three children away and then briefly removed 14 children from her extended family. The first thing that came to us and said, well, well, you started an appeal. Nothing else. Ain't that crazy? So just because she started an appeal because she wanted to stand up for their rights, and her rights, as we the people, as we all should be doing, uh, CFS went ahead, CPS, they went ahead and retaliated, took her, it took her children's, um, her family's children, like, it's crazy, because I know I've been getting gang stalked, ever since I've been going through this with CFS Las Vegas, like, I'm getting gang stalked, 
and they need to stop because I'm protected against my violence. So they need to go find somebody else to pick on. They're retaliating against you, Ethan? Basically. Yeah, my whole family, they retaliated. <laughs> it, it ain't stopped there. We tried to check out this allegation, but CPS won't talk to us about individual cases. Attorney Bob Bishop couldn't believe what he saw when he took Shank's case and reviewed this hearing that he says contains no proof. There has to be something, some evidence of wrongdoing that has placed the child in imminent danger or has hurt, hurt the child and uh, a pattern of, uh, of conduct, that type of conduct. And that's not due to poverty alone. He would come home, he'd say, you wouldn't believe this, you know. And he says, I just, I just can't believe these stories I'm hearing. And then it happened to us. That's right. Social workers have removed Bishop's adopted daughter from their home, too. Again, records in this case are sealed. And they said, if, if you do not cooperate with us, we're going to take all your children and we're going to um, charge you with emotional abuse. Fortunately for Vanessa Shanks, the Kentucky Court of Appeals has ruled the judge made a mistake in allowing her three children to be removed, and she is going to get them back. The court unanimously ruled the state acted in haste and offered no proof of abuse or neglect. That's good. So she ended up getting her children back and all of that. So I'm glad that she stood up. I'm glad that she fought. And I'm glad that it was also televised for the people. Now, moving along, I have here Nancy Schaefer, the background story on Nancy Schaefer. Uh, she was a whistleblower. She actually used to work for CPS and all of that. And she saw all the corruption. So she um, resigned. She started to be an advocate for, um, you know, CPS and how they abuse children. And mysteriously, her and her husband were found allegedly suicide in their home. But of course, um, the rumors are that they were assassinated due to the fact that she was standing up and, you know, um, helping the people. And rest in peace, uh, Nancy Safer. She definitely did a great job in regards to um, bringing awareness to CPS abusing children. This is not to say that there are not those children in wretched situations who need to be removed. There are, and we all agree. But tonight, I'm talking about those children removed from their homes intentionally for profit. Children are seized unnecessarily from their families due to the federal aid created in 1974 entitled the Adoption and Safe Families Act. It offers financial incentives to the states that increase adoption numbers. To receive the adoption incentives or bonuses, local CPS must have more children. They must have more merchandise to sell. Funding is available when a child is placed in a foster home with strangers or placed in a mental health facility and medicated usually against the parents' wishes. Parents are victimized by the system that makes a profit for holding children longer and bonuses for not retur returning children to their parents. This is abuse of power. It is lack of accountability. And it is a growing criminal political phenomenon spreading around the globe. Oftentimes, but not always, poor parents are targeted to lose their children because they do not have the wherewithal to hire an attorney or fight the system. Being poor and lacking proper housing does not mean your children should be removed. CPS has redefined poor to mean psychologically inferior. Therefore, it is in the best interest of the child to be removed. Best interest, of course, has also been redefined at the child's expense. It has been reported over and over that six times as many children die in foster care than in the general public. Once a child is legally kidnapped, and placed in official safety, the child is far more likely to suffer abuse, including sexual molestation 
and or rape. Case workers and social workers are often guilty of fraud. They withhold and destroy evidence and they seek wrongly to terminate parental rights while being protected by state immunity. There is a huge bureaucracy made up of judges, court of- And by the point, um, they do not have immunity. I have said that in several of my affidavits. Again, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Officers of, of the court actually don't have any immunity when it comes to human trafficking- Pointed attorneys. And things of that nature. Guardian ad litems social workers, state employees, court investigators, therapists, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, foster parents, adoptive parents, and on and on, who are looking to the children in state care for their job security. Judges have control over private living arrangements and income of 48.3 million Americans. The United States Census Bureau reported in 2002 that 40 billion in transfer payments were made between households of custody parents and other parents. How about that? Financial gain, using my baby for a profit. She's being held captive for a profit. That money, 40 billion, is under the direction and control of family court judges. In environments covered with confidentiality laws that protect the wrong people. Fathers are victims of this unjust system. Child support payments, even without having visits with their children, are choking the very life out of fathers. Again, I for nothing. That's why they be trying to be all nosy in regards to the sperm donor. And I'm actually going to share another video um, of some testimonies in regards to the fraud. So your idea of capitalize as, uh, capitalism is a parent has to have to see the kids. They have to have money. And if they can't afford it, which a lot of brown people cannot, they lose custody altogether. That's not capitalism. That's more like something like Swinism. And what's the definition of Swinism? It's like the Supreme Court said about pornography. I can't define it, but if you see it, you know it. They are trying to terminate visitation between the brothers too, by the way. My son, who's 15, is not supposed to see his brothers. He's a danger to them. We're not a danger to anybody. We're not a danger to each other. We're a danger to you because we expose your criminal and illegal activities. The poor parents in LA County, they have no rights. When you have money, you can afford a private attorney, which I initially did, and I won. Now I have a court-appointed attorney, and I can't even see my children. Money speaks, but not a good message. Please. Good afternoon. My name's Yoli, and I'm here today to respectfully ask that <clears throat> sexual, physical abuse be treated as a serious crime that it is, and be investigated thoroughly by specially trained professionals who are part of a multidisciplinary team. Children are being abused, molested, and raped, and even murdered due to the failures of our present system. Courts are dismissing and concealing evidence of abuse. Our courts go as far as labeling and accusing protective parents with mental illness, PAS, which is parental alienation syndrome. And in fact, PAS is not even a law, but the courts use it as if it is, and, a, uh, and are using this against uh, protective parents in, the, in our courts. Court appointed 730 evaluators are submitting fraudulent reports that are destroying hundreds of families. Minors councils at Edelman's Children's Court are recommending custody to uh, substantiated abusers every day. The policy to reunify a child or children with a parent that has a history of domestic violence needs to change. There has been too many deaths of children due to this policy. I'm respectfully asking that changes please be made to our system that will help protect our children. Thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Rafaelina Duval. Okay, so this statement right here is um, really powerful. Uh, this mother actually fought 
oh goodness, seven years for her baby. I think her her son was kidnapped at 12 months. A very heartbreaking story. She ended up winning. Um, she did change a law as well, quote unquote, um, at her state court, I forget. But um, I'll let her say her testimony. And I would like to address the board. Last Friday, the jury uh, on Duval versus County of Los Angeles sent you a message regarding your deliberate indifference to the policies, customs of DCFS. It's been a long time that many advocates, many families have come to you and it has taken DCFS ruining my family for you to listen. I've been here before and you've never listened. None of the uh, warrantless removal of children in this county is changing. And you gotta understand what the approach is going to be. We will sue you over and over and we will pound you because what you're doing to the children here, DCFS has lost its ability to make proper assessments. I happen to be a mother that had resources to fight you, but I guarantee you, I will enlist every case that has merits and you will hear from me again. And I'm asking you, don't fight the peers, the 12 people who sent the message to you because there'll be a lot more. And I'm asking you, change the policies, the, dis the discriminatory policies, you know what they are, read my complaint. The discriminatory policies against parents with disability children, with disability, there is no reason why you should have put me through this six years litigating you, tooth and nail. But you know what? I am a minority, I'm a woman, but I also come from a strong family and I will fight you till the end. So we'll see each other in the Court of Appeals, but I want you to know it's time to change because the mothers are coming, the fathers are coming, the community is coming. Time to change for our supervisors, please. Facts, powerful. She said, I will fight you to the end. I feel every word she said to um with her because it's gotta stop. These people are literally fraudulently and they continue to lie on documents, things of that nature. Now, this video is also really powerful. Um it's actually where uh they went in front a CFS uh de facto representative went in front of the de facto court. This might be Supreme Court, I'm not sure. Um, but she, you know, trying to play the role in regards to C CPS, CFS, DCSS community, and they, you know, had to let her know what it is. Um, the qualified immunity analysis and whether the law is clearly established, it is typically plaintiff's burden to come forward to this court and say, here's the case law. This is this is what tells the the state actors, the government actors, that they should have known better. It's clearly set forth in this case law. In, in, in our matter here, it's interesting because the reverse has actually happened. This court has actually found that as of the date of the underlying conduct here in 2000, when- um, You're talking about Costanich? That is Costanich correct. Costanich deals with foster care licenses and guardians, not natural children of parents. Costanich deals with the underlying liberty interest of a 14th amendment claim which is the for, same for foster parents for foster so parents it's that is true a guardianship and guardianship not natural parents it seems to me that as early as the 1940s the united states supreme court has held that there is an absolute liberty interest a fundamental liberty interest that parents have in the care custody and control of their children that's been on the books forever i, I have a whole bunch of supreme court you heard that <laughs> you heard that Hey, I'm gonna go back. Guardianship. And guardianship, not natural parents. It seems to me that as early as the 1940s, the United States Supreme Court has held that there is an absolute liberty interest, a fundamental liberty interest that parents have in the care, custody, and control of their children. You hear that? We have the liberty. We have, we are the most important as a parent. We are the most important for the care of the children. He even said that, at least he told the truth. Somebody telling the truth here. That's been on the books forever. I, mean, I have a whole bunch of Supreme Court cases I could read from, that's just gonna waste a lot of time. That they have that- He like, I'm not even supposed to go back and forth with you. You already know what it is. That fundamental constitutional right. There, it, and it cannot true. be impaired without due process of law. And the- 
Boom, I like him. He's telling the truth. Where the qualified immunity analysis and the clearly established law plays into this is, do we have case law that tells us that- No, no, no. If you read, you've read Help versus Pelter. That doesn't have to be case law. There can be other ways of showing that it's clearly established. Case law is not an absolute requirement. It, it is- Have it, you read Help Hope versus Pelzer and all the other cases that talk about that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, there does not have to be a case on all fours. It, you're correct. It correct. It does not have okay. to be a case on all fours. Right. What isn't Help. clearly established here? The fact that what what's what Cassandra says, what's not been clearly established in the year 2000 when this removal occurred was the idea that um, the right to be free from deliberately fabricated evidence in civil child abuse proceedings um, that result in the deprivation of a protected liberty interest, the same liberty interest that's at issue. But it's not the same liberty interest because this was a parental liberty interest. It, it's it's a biological versus foster parent. That's huge. That's gigantic it, in terms of what somebody could appreciate and, and understand. How in the world could a person in the position of, you know, we have to take the facts as they're pleaded in the light most favorable. So, you know, we're not trying the case, but how could a person in the, in the shoes of your clients possibly believe that it was appropriate to use perjury and false evidence in order to impair somebody's liberty interest in the continued care, custody, and control of that person's children. How could they possibly not be on notice that you can't do that? <laughs> so when these CPS and CFS workers try to act stupid, it's like, how can you possibly not know that you can't just take somebody's child or baby, in my case, and not have any proof or evidence, and it's nothing wrong with that? Like, come on now. I understand the- How could they, how could that possibly be? I understand the argument that it seems to be common sense and our ethical- It's more than common sense. It's statutes that prohibit per perjury and, and submission of false evidence in court cases. State statutes. Are you telling me that a, that a person in your client's shoes couldn't understand you can't commit perjury in a court proceeding in order to take somebody's children away? That's Nicholas Eason. Nicholas Eason committed perjury. Of course not, Your Honor. Of course not. Uh, isn't the case over then? And the case is over. Because it, well, Costanich is distinguishable in my view. How, how in the world, Costanich deals with a secondary care, you know, foster care. That's a whole strange thing. It's not a person's real, ch real child. Exactly. So how do you think is going with my situation where they have my child kidnapped and now she's been currently held captive by this European lady named Sarah Ledoux, who's not, you know, familiar with my customs and our culture. And she's a European, and like, come on now. Even if Kostanich is- And Guardian's the same thing. Even if Kostanich is distinguishable, um, there is, thus far, we have not been presented with any um, clearly established right that tells us that what our clients did, which is remove the children pursuant to a court order. No, but um, what they're accused of doing and what the issue is here is committing perjury in a court to take away someone's children. And you just said that's obviously not okay to do. And falsifying documents. You can't be falsifying documents neither. In, according to our moral compass and our ethical guidelines, but what we're here to decide is the constitutionality of it and we look to the courts. You, to you, you mean due process is somehow consistent with a government official introducing perjured testimony and false? How is that consistent? I mean, I hate to get pumped up about this, but I'm, st I'm just staggered by <laughs> the claim that people it's in the shoes too. of your clients wouldn't be on notice that you can't use perjury and false evidence to take away somebody's children. That to me is mind boggling. In, and in, in, in criminal proceedings, we know this to be true because that- No, no, like criminal proceedings, bad. this is, it's court, it's a court proceeding with a liberty interest, a fundamental liberty interest at stake. Fundamental liberty. And on the reverse side, the state- And you're telling us that, you're telling us that these officials who do this all the time, couldn't be on notice that you can't commit perjury and put in false evidence. I understand broadly the principle that um, common sense tells us that lying is wrong and lying to- Yeah, but it's more than sense. common sense. We're not using common sense. We're using the statutes, for example, against this kind of behavior. I, I don't, I, I was not presented. I have not been seen any federal law, case law or law that tells me 
that in this situation that we were faced in, uh, which is what we have well, to say your at, say your clients uh, hired six people to be actors and to go into court and say we're neighbors and we saw all this terrible stuff. And then your clients presented those witnesses in, in court. You're telling me that they would have no reason to believe that you can't do that because there was no federal case that says you can't bring actors into court to swear falsely against somebody. But again, here we're appealing to sort of a broader definition of what is a clearly established right. I mean, we have to find the clearly established right in the context that our um, social workers were presented with, which was they were faced with the court order. You know, again, I can't even believe for a microsecond that if that a caseworker wouldn't understand you can't lie and put in false evidence. Well, let me ask the question a different way, counsel. Was there anything you know of that told social workers that they should lie? And they should create false evidence in a court proceeding. No, and of course, you know that is. Oh. Uh, we contend that that's not what happened here. I understand. I understand. And look, and, and yeah, we're stuck with the facts. We're, we're, must fail. And to be clear, we are only speaking that right. we accept the pleadings as alleged. We are not saying any of this is true. I'll be very clear about that. But right. that's what we're dealing with right now. Is there anything? I mean, look, you got your client. You're doing your best to to uh, represent them here. But from our perspective, you see where we're coming from here. So help us. Okay, we've, we've talked about Castanets. Make it make sense. We've said that case is, it, there's some language in there, which I understand what you're pointing to. I got you. But it, as Judge Friedland, Judge Trotter both said, it also does have a different interest. So is there any case besides Castanets that you can point to and say, here's Ninth Circuit, this is the answer? Well, um, what I would contend, Your Honor, is that was plaintiff's burden to do when it came to all of it. Oh, I, I understand that your argument, but, but just, just for your sake, because you, you reached to Costanich, which if I were in your shoes, I'd be reaching for it too, as, as hard as I possibly can. Is there, is there another case? You got one hand kind of on the ledge here with Costanich. Is there another hand you can grab another Ninth Circuit case where you've got a firm grasp? You can say, see, I've got it. In terms of another Ninth Circuit case that instructs social workers to lie and cheat. Or at least that's a time period. At least that's a time period that says, as of this date, you can't do this anymore. Other than Kostanich, um, Your Honor, I, I do not have any such case uh, in front of me. As a matter of fact, Snell is, precedes all of this. And we have... I'm actually going to stop there now. Um, Y'all can go and research some of that video as well if you'd like to. Some court cases... I'm going to play another video. Did I play this one already? I don't know. But I'm actually going to play another video to link something up as well in regards to the fraud. All right. I think this one is it. Three years now. Abuse of power, falsified documents, lies in court, threats, and retaliation against parents who fight back. We've heard from victims, attorneys, and officials about what's going on, but we haven't heard from the social workers themselves until now. In disturbing detail, they back up many of the things we've reported. That families are harassed and workers are pressured, all in an effort to boost adoption numbers. She would not ignore a half dozen allegations of abuse in this foster home. A state social worker was fired. I did, but I felt like I had to do. It was the right thing to do, and I stand by the complaint. Because Pat Moore of Ellesmere, Kentucky, knew she was right, she filed a lawsuit. And last month, the state paid her $380,000 to settle it. When she found that two foster parents had criminal records, a son living there with multiple felonies, and a convicted sex offender visiting and sometimes caring for the children, she refused to arrange an adoption. Her CPS supervisors responded with this memo recommending the adoption should proceed quickly. Our theory is that the basis for this is the, the tie to federal money, that every time a child is not placed in a home, the state of Kentucky through its cabinet is losing its federal money. It's an allegation we've seen many times in our three-year-long investigation of Kentucky CPS that instead of trying to bring families together, the cabinet forces adoptions to earn more federal bonus money. And it apparently started in 2004 when adoptions in Kentucky ballooned to 724 while the federal bonus money more than doubled from 452,000 the year before to more than a million. Statistics. The cabinet puts pressure on statistics because federal money and state money come from statistics. This former state social worker is so afraid of retaliation on her family by the cabinet 
she asked us to conceal her identity. You get praise. The cabinet praises you for terminating rights and adopting the kids out immediately. She says the concerted effort to take children away and put them up for adoption was so brazen, she actually saw someone successfully place an order for children. Someone could not have a child and wanted a child, so. We heard that they place in orders. That's what I'm saying. They'd be targeting solo mothers and placing orders. So within the community, this certain person saw a family that was in distress, was having a hard time, and relayed to workers that they would like those children. And that's exactly what has happened. And this former CPS supervisor, who also fears retaliation, says if an order for a child was delayed or denied, her supervisors would roll in and try to overturn local decisions. This one family was promised a child. And when it happened that the child was going to be reunified with the parent, um, they called our regional office. Our regional office uh, came down on, on our county. They uh, harassed the birth parents and that kind of thing because they didn't agree with our decision. That's what I need to say, bye. And remember the case of Vanessa Shanks, who had her kids taken away, and when she fought back, saw her relative's kids taken away, and when she won her appeal, saw her attorney's child taken away. <laughs> These wow. former CPS workers say that kind of retaliatory power is common. And in this secretive one-side system, they can take your kids away right now if they want to and get away with it. I can call in and report tomorrow and I can make it seem very real to the point that a family will be investigated and whoever gets it could come up with a substantiation of say let's say neglect and it might not be true but it it doesn't matter now according to data just <sighs> yep that is a fact it don't be true and they still be moving forward still in the babies just crazy Another video, this is a good video in regards to another success. Judge Mike Schneider not only found CPS case worker LeVar Jones and his supervisor Naisha Edwards lied under oath to take Michael and Melissa Bright's two kids from them. He says they didn't even tell the couple about the removal, which is required by law. The thing that bothers me the most is that these were investigative orders. Again, like I said, they, you know, try to withhold evidence from me. I even have emails in regards to them not giving me reports and things like that. So they, the people in my case and situation are doing the same thing. That's why it's crazy. It's like I've researched their tactics, though. They do this worldwide. Well, yeah, they do this across the states. Workers. Yet they did nothing. Not only was there no proper investigation, Jones sought an emergency Same. order, claiming the kids Same. were in immediate danger, even though he hadn't laid eyes on them that for part. more than 30 days. The CPS workers were convinced Melissa Bright caused her five-month-old son's head injury, even though there was no proof of that. It was devastating. No mother should have to do that. The Bright's attorneys told right. CPS, right. give the couple their kids back, and they would not seek sanctions against the agency. CPS refused. I even said that. I was like, just give her back and I won't, you know, proceed to criminal prosecution. So they like, girl, do it then. Like, wow, the audacity. <laughs> Gotta take them to Supreme. And they now already Judge Steiner too. has given them the stiffest sanctions to date. On December the 5th, CPS must appear in his court with a plan on how to retrain almost every CPS employee in Good. the Houston region on laws regarding Good. the removal of children. Good. He also ordered the agency to pay the Brights $127,000 for their legal fees and other expenses the ordeal cost them. Good. We had two goals. The first was to get our kids back, and then the second was to become change agents. Yep. And bringing the Brights ordeal to light has rocked CPS's status quo. I cannot fathom that CPS hasn't gotten the message yeah, that right? it's wrong to take people's children and lie about it. But judging by the reaction of CPS officials who were in the courtroom when the judge imposed the sanctions, the agency doesn't seem to care. As we were ending the sanctions hearing, LeVar Jones was in the back of the courthouse giggling and laughing. He clearly didn't think this was a big deal.
the bride's attorneys are that's what i'm saying they um i had a special appearance they did the same thing they started laughing i think to myself these are demos uh, I told this man, have a nice day. Like, I only want to talk to you. Have a nice day. You know me. I know etymology. Nice means stupid. But uh, he going to say, yes, I will have a nice day because I'm going home to my children or my kids. I think he said kids. Um, but yeah, this is the caseworker talking to me like that. That was just so unprofessional. So it's just absolutely just inhumane to even speak to a person like that, period. So I know the feeling like witness testimony. Yep, that's what they do too. I've experienced it. Yeah, what, well, what can somebody do to lose this? The legislature, the people gave this to the to the litigants. What can they do to lose and it? Forget about all that for a second. This is that right, so this is another um, court of appeals. They question state over judge taking away constitutional rights of parents. Because again, um, CFS is trying to take away my constitutional rights. And so this is like, okay, how do you even think that this is possible? Like who told you you had that right? It's unalienable. So um, I'm gonna let some, some other, um, you know, quote unquote, de facto judge tell the truth, because at least they be telling the truth. See, they they withhold their oath. They took that oath and they, they're gonna, it's, it's definitely good, good ones out here. We can't say everybody's bad. That's definitely not the, even the way of thinking. Um, yeah, so he's he's telling the truth. To examine pertinent court files and records, don't know, and to appeal the orders of the court. Yeah, what, well, what can somebody do to lose this? The legislature, the people gave this to the, to the litigants, we the people. what can they do to lose and it? Forget about all that for a second. That statute has to be read through the lens of the Constitution. You heard that? That statute has to be read through the lens of the Constitution, meaning if they, you know what I'm saying, if they have any conflict, the Constitution is always going to supersede. So as far as them, you know, throwing out these statutes and everything, they're null and void, void as I've been saying this whole time, this whole time, and at least somebody telling the truth, another one telling the truth. We're talking about interfering with the right to familiar relations, the government coming in and taking custody away from parents. And, and it, it looks to me like there was little to no due process. And not only that, but in making the consideration because of that constitutional requirement, protecting a fundamental constitutional right. Fundamental. We require clear and convincing evidence clear and before convincing. we take away someone's kids based on evidence at the time of the hearing, if there was, even was one, whether it's termination or custody. So help me understand. Help me understand. I just point out that there was no deprivation of the right to counsel. They did have counsel at the time of the hearing. And in fact, um, the hearing, for, the, hearing pre, the previous hearing, they had it at um, the juvenile, they had it at all stages of the hearing and they had it at the juvenile review hearing. Well, I, but, thought, I thought counsel withdrew right before the they hearing withdrew, and, they asked, and they asked for a continuance and the judge said no, which meant and the, the purpose of the continuous was to get a lawyer and the judge acknowledged the motion but said no am i going to no continue? what happened was um the appellants had gotten that notice they had already taken steps to get another attorney and they had already hired another attorney that attorney could not be present at the time right so um they had um the, they did were not deprived of their right to counsel well, 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 wait, 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 wait a minute wait a minute mm -hmm. did they have a lawyer there that day they did have a lawyer who was allowed to withdraw, and then they had... Okay, so that means at the time of the hearing, when all this stuff happened, they didn't have a lawyer that was there, right? You agree with that? Um, and, and, well, I mean, no, let's... No. Physically present. Was there a lawyer at that hearing? One withdrew, he's gone. Was he there? He was not there, but okay. um, this is the standard is these were not indigent counsel. Now, in de it, dependency proceedings... You have a right to counsel, but you also have the right to waive counsel. And what the juvenile court found here yeah, was that appellants had waived counsel. This is the juvenile court that says it's me against you? That This is the judge? Well, that was taken out of context. The juvenile court obviously had no animosity. The animosity was one way because the juvenile court gave custody of the children back to appellants, even though they were open. You know, I would, I would have to. If I was juvenile court judge and this, and, and then these people become felons, they're felons because of me, I'd get it back to them too and hope that's all that happened to me. Huh. But that's just me. Huh. What did they do to waive their counsel? Well, they had um, the, the standard, and this is um, listed and um, outlined in the interest of AMA 270 GA app. Uh, 7 all right, I'm actually going to pause right there. Uh, let me
me see if she talks about something else that's pretty interesting. Uh, because if the, the court has given custody back to the to the um, appellant and said there's no more dependency here, they can't, the court can't act unless there's another finding of dependency, another dependency petition. Okay. <laughs> All right. They um, suck like this lady's a fool. This lady's a fool. It's got to stop. It's got to stop. And I actually want to close with Nancy Schaefer. I'm going to play a little bit more of her video. And then, um, yeah, I'll be back at it again. Back at it again. All right, so this is where we left off, and this is where we'll pick up. Three fathers, of whom I am aware and have been in touch with, committed suicide in the last 12 months because they lost the opportunity to even visit with their children. Right, not for nothing. It will drive you mentally insane. Not saying that I have had any suicidal thoughts or I am, you know, trying to hurt myself or in the future, anything of that nature. But I could understand how this would drive a person crazy. Indeed. These are crimes against humanity for financial gain. Rights are removed from parents. Human rights, civil rights, and even religious rights. One illustration of what took place in my district is that after so many calls, I decided to call a meeting in one of the counties of my own district. I personally called 37 families that had been in touch with me who had all lost their children, grandchildren. I had to meet me in the library one Saturday morning. We started at nine o'clock and we ended at nine o'clock. We had 50 families standing outside the door that could not get in. We didn't have time to talk with them. There was incredible anguish and profound suffering from these families. Some children had been taken off the school bus, taken out of the hospitals, or taken out of their homes in the middle of the night, and even worse. It was just, an incredible ordeal. These parents, trapped in the system, become like refugees. They're dazed and glazed and have no one of whom to turn. They do not know what to do, and the loss of their children is devastating. After having worked in this arena for several years, I do not believe that a single child comes out whole after having been in this system. Many foster children make up the homeless population of today. I introduced legislation, Senate Bill 415, in my last session. A substitute bill was written at the last minute by the chairman of the Judicial Committee 